really terrific introduction and sort of segue into this. And it's my understanding, if I'm correct, that I'm supposed to talk about 20 minutes and then we're going to have an open sort of panel discussion, right? And then discussion. Okay, great. Um, so um, let me add to the history that Keith's wonderfully given us. Because um, John Badika, for any of you who knew him and many of us who worked very closely with, um, he was quite a character. Um, and he led this development of sort of an acute pain model, an anesthesiologist model that he was an extraordinary um, advocate for. And at the same time had this question of how do we deal with the chronic pain patient. And so created in Washington this extraordinary clinic that basically was taking patients who um, uh, had the sort of learned helpless behave, helplessness behavior um, and putting them through an incredible six week rigorous inpatient rehabilitation program um, and taking them off their opioids um, and um, teaching them behavioral approaches, um, giving them physical therapy, and then sending them back out uh, into the world. And the success rate at the clinic was that clearly patients came off opioids, um, but it was always hard to, for them to prove for sure that the patient's pain was necessarily any better. Um, and this was the critique, in a sense, of that model. At the same time, John Benique in the mid to late 70s uh, was asked um, by the World Health Organization to come on and address the issue of cancer pain. And that's, as you know, that's the area that I've worked in, so, that, so my focus in history is on the cancer pain issue. And this was the era, if you remember, the mid-70s, was um, by 75, we still didn't even know we had opiate receptors in our brain. I mean, we, you know, so it was the discovery of the opiate receptor that sort of came forth, then the discovery of endorphins. And so this made pain a lot more respectable because we all of a sudden had specific receptors in our brain to which the drugs that were exogenously being used were now binding to. So there was a rationale. And more importantly, we had um, endorphins that um, these particular compounds were made within our bodies to bind to these receptors. So it led to a, a different science, a science that John Benica didn't have the advantage to. He knew about sodium channels and anesthetics, not about opiate receptors. So we moved into the opiate receptor world extraordinary respect for the idea that the brain had these receptors and that these exogenous drugs were like good for our brains because it must be a reason why we have them. So fast forward into the cancer arena was this sense that um, we were under treating patients with pain. And it was also at the same time that there was this rise of extraordinary expertise in analgesic studies in how to measure pain in drug trials how to be able to do carefully controlled, randomized controlled trials, how to learn to deal with placebo treatment, and to be able to do and have a science of analgesic studies that could bring drugs to market that demonstrated their efficacy as pain. So there's a whole science of pain that emerged in that period of time that made the role of analgesic drugs in general very important, a very respected, and the rise of the whole movement. And the cancer patient became that particular uh, patient model. And I, I bring that to the fore because I think that history um, was critically important because it was the, the first uh, science that pain had, sort of the gate theory of pain. Um, it was much more um, tied to a, a clear neuroscience where there was a great deal of interest then in receptor physiology and pharmacology. And it was very tied to a drug a pharmaceutical market that now had these potential receptors of which they could target drugs and develop methodologies. So that's that history. Then came the growth and the emphasis of the hospice movement. So we had the British, you know, Cecily Saunders telling us that dying patients um, could be put into a um, unit. They could be given drugs like oral morphine and oral heroin. Uh, that their pain was controlled and that they died comfortably. And so the rise of the hospice movement then further sort of fed into this development of analgesic drugs. And so the target of so much of the analgesic market was on two populations. It was non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for the arthritis, because we had methodology of analgesic studies, and opioids for the cancer patient who was dying because we had this hospice model. And then we had a reimbursement in 1982 when the hospice benefit was passed. So now we had a, a system that was going to be paid for in which um, one could then begin to introduce different approaches. So that sort of, so this was this microcosm of the pain world, but it drove it because it was analgesic studies, it was good science, it was opiate receptors, et cetera. And, and so I think that that 
changed how we viewed opioids in the clinical setting. And then it was the experience with the cancer population from like the early 1980s through to 1997, where we could show um, the increasing amount of prescribing of opioids and no evidence of abuse. And it wasn't until 97 and 99 where we began to see the abuse issues. But there's paper after paper published of states increasing their availability of opioids. Wisconsin was one of the models. And no evidence of this diffusion into that market. But when the pharmaceutical companies started marketing to a broader market of individuals is when we began to see prescription drug abuse and then it's taken off after that. And in no way do I want to trivialize prescription drug abuse. But there's more issues than that. So I start with this data because I think we have to you know, deal with the reality of why are we in the situation that we're now and why I just want to spend a few minutes on what I think are some politics. So this is the data that the CDC continues to um, spend its time on. The CDC has never spent any time on measuring pain. OK. This is not the, this is. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> OK, I'll just keep moving forward here. Um, it reminds me of when I went to present our improving palliative care report to the uh, um, NCI and uh, the Twin Towers fell. So, um, um, so the CDC has uh, published this data, and this is what the public is seeing. This is what the CDC is focused on. This is uh, this issue of overdose deaths. This is all that seems to be matters, um, and clearly overdose deaths have a priority in our public agenda. And they're very serious. The extraordinary impact that this plays on our society is profound. But we could make this so much better quick and fast. We have a drug called naloxone. We can put naloxone out on the streets of every city in this country. We can put it in the pocket of everyone. It's an incredibly safe drug. And that anyone who gets sleeping on a drug could be given naloxone immediately with enough time to get to an emergency room. And then we could change the policies that when you got to that emergency room, you were not imprisoned, you not, the police didn't arrive, but doctors took care of you. And that those who brought you there were good Samaritans, and that drug, the whole issue is around the uh, policing of, of drug use could be changed. So we, could, we can stop this um, really pretty uh, much. And there's evidence to suggest that when you make naloxone available in these kinds of settings, there's an opportunity. So there is a way to deal with this, but that means that you have to have a much more liberal view uh, about how you do this. Has everybody got this? OK, good. OK, so let's move from that. <laughs> So what are the impact of politics on clinical care? So are the current challenges to the use of opioids properly motivated? These are the questions that Myra asked me. So these, I think, would be the questions that we should be discussing. Uh, what are my experiences with how the politics of pain management impact those living with chronic pain and those who care for them? And I'm going to talk to you, give you a couple of examples of that. And I'm going to focus pretty much on the cancer pain population because that's the population I have the most experience with. And then this bigger question that we've had a little bit of a discussion about, are we in the era of recriminalization of opioid use? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. So what are some of these kinds of examples? Um, so I think the other piece in this overdose aspect is remember there are 259 million opioid prescriptions being written and only 16,000 deaths. I mean, that's nothing if we think they're even related, okay? And there's a stretch between the relationship to the number of prescriptions written and the number of overdoses and where those drugs come. So that, uh, and there are people that have those facts. So who is the population um, at risk of pain of policies that focus on drugs? It clearly is the chronic pain patient who has multiple co comorbidities. Because I think as Keith was uh, emphasizing, um, these are patients with, who require a chronic care, um, chronic, a model of chronic care. Uh, they require a multidiscipline uh, area of care. Um, the reimbursements that are out there are now, we hope, um, developing and expanding. Uh, but we don't really have a clear um, uh, sense of how they can be reimbursed. Because we don't reimburse team care. We don't reimburse uh, chronic care. We don't re reimburse acute care. And I think we've learned this um, when in, in the focus, if you look at the dying patient, there's no DRG for dying. So if you're dying in a hospital, you got to get out that door quickly. Because the minute you're identified as dying, there's no DRG for it. 
the clock's ticking on the, the, uh, that, that bed and get out the door. So we know if we don't have DRGs, if we don't have um, clear uh, reimbursement strategies for individual uh, uh, patterns of care, they're not reimbursed. So I think that as Keith was describing, what is the, the how, would, how do we find this? What do we need in a national pain strategy? We clearly need the ability to have um, systems that bundle it to the care system in general. Um, if you look at the uh, development of PCAs in the, in the US and what that financing was, um, it was a big problem in the beginning because the hospitals had to buy all those pumps and who was gonna pay for those pumps? And then was it gonna be the surgeons that had to give up the money or the anesthesiologists that gave up the money? And then they figured out a great strategy of how doing this was cost effective, it reduced uh, nursing time, it reduced doctor time, it reduced pharmacy time, and they came up with an economic model for PCAs. Be assured, if there was no economic model for PCAs, they would have never happened. So in each of these, we need to think of what those economic models are. A second population are those patients who have um, uh, not only chronic pain, but have serious mental health disorders. And you know the numbers vary, but upwards of 30 to 40% of patients uh, with chronic pain are thought to have serious mental uh, health disorders. So we know mental health care in this country is problematic, and then they add pain into that agenda, and how do we begin and provide care for those individuals? There's a third population, and they're the chronic pain patients with a past history or concurrent history of substance abuse or misuse. And there are groups who think that those people should never be given an opioid. And then there are others that think that they should be given them in appropriate circumstances. And there's a really nice book coming out on uh, the treatment of chronic pain in HIV patients uh, who have a high risk of drug abuse, and some really uh, wonderful, great chapters uh, that focus on how to use behavioral um, and cognitive approaches in those, how to model clinics, how to contain um, the use of drugs in that population, uh, and how to provide them with appropriate care. So I think we're, we're seeing sort of models that potentially could work for that population. Uh, in my own institution, we have, um, have developed protocols for patients who have a history of previous substance abuse uh, to be able to provide for them when they're ad admitted to the hospital the idea that, uh, and have open discussions about how we're going to manage your pain and putting in place for them in the most um, collaborative uh, fashion um, how we manage their pain. But I can't begin to tell you that um, as I could look out my office to a park across the street from Memorial, I could see drug dealing in the park um, and yet the kinds of restrictions that I had to deal with every day to write a prescription for as the same patient um, to be able to get uh, the prescription in my pharmacy was enormously problematic. So we were, you know, um, how do we, be you can understand why such individuals go to the street to get their drugs, because it's easier. Not necessarily cheaper, but easier. And then we have now this emerging large population of chronic pain patients who are cancer survivors. And the, you know, depending upon the numbers um, and who you look at, who you read, and the, the um, adequacy of the studies, the number of cancer survivors who have chronic pain goes from 29% in one study up to 80% in another study. And everybody now is saying at an international level that it looks like somewhere around 37, 38% of cancer survivors have chronic pain. So does the cancer label protect them in some way to be able to give access to drugs? Does it make them more respectable than the non-cancer patient? Um, my view of all of this is that opiate receptors in our brain don't know you have cancer, okay? So there's no science to this idea of cancer pain here and chronic non-malignant pain here. The opiate receptors don't know that. So then these are the kinds of little anecdotal stories that I could add to this that is pretty extraordinary to me. I recently heard a presentation by a group of individuals who care for patients with cystic fibrosis that are awaiting lung transplant. The one thing um, that these patients have is profound dyspnea, and a good treatment for that dyspnea is morphine. However, if they are taking a lot of morphine as they're moving toward that lung transplant, it's unlikely that they're gonna get it. So what do they do? They hold back on the morphine. And this is coming from clinicians that are working in these lung transplant programs. So um, is there any reason to think you would do that? Uh, a second population are those with advanced um, COPD who have severe dyspnea. And again, 
uh, a negativity toward giving them chronic opioids. These are low-dose opioids that are being used in this population with now well-controlled <laughs> randomized trials that show that morphine for dyspnea uh, works and it's being withheld from those patient populations. What's the ethics of that? Then there's the terminally ill cancer patient in a prison or in a jail. Um, and so we had this opportunity to work with, the, um, Angola, with Angola and with the uh, warden there uh, and with the creation of a hospice program within Angola and made a video of this. And one of the best parts of that video is seeing them passing MS content through the jailed you know, wall, wall, walls of these individuals. These are people that uh, will die in prison. 85% of Angola is um, lifers. They're there for life because of the serious crimes they've committed. Um, and um, how do we care for that population of individuals? And this is, you know, a that's Angola prison, but then we move to the jails that are currently housing large numbers of now elderly people with significant medical comorbidities and pain, and how and to what extent should we as a society care for them? And the one place you have a right to, right to health care in the United States is in prison or jail. And so this should seem to me an argument for they have a right to health care, we should be able to at least provide health care. But I can tell you that I was practically thrown out of a meeting with prison authorities because they said, look, you don't understand, there's no way we can control these drugs in the prison, there's no way we could do this or that. Um, there's, Angola has demonstrated that you can do it. There's been a movement of hospice programs around the country that have demonstrated that you could do it for that population. It opens up lots of challenges, but you know that's what this is about. And then lastly, the terminally ill cancer patients. So we're now, and I think hearing you know, the, my colleague up there, I agree, we were in the heydays of the 90s where we could do most things for cancer patients, not anymore. So this is what's happening in my institution for cancer patients. This is you know, the great center that I work in. Um, uh, and, and it comes to the, the sort of framing of what um, and how the, the challenges of what's the science and what the politics are. And so there is this belief out there, if we reduce physician prescribing, we're going to reduce overdose. Um, if we reduce physician prescribing, we're going to reduce misuse and abuse. Show me the data. If we um, have prescription monitoring programs, we're going to reduce misuse. And I'm not against prescription monitoring programs, but we need good evidence to demonstrate this works. But the catch is, I prescribe for people in New Jersey, um, but I have to go into my New York prescription monitoring program, but they're not in there. So this immediately, prescribing for a person in another state, I mean, if we're gonna do prescription monitoring, we need a country prescription monitoring, a countrywide approach, not this statewide issue. And here it must be tough because you've got Kansas and Missouri unless you're sharing the data. So that's an issue. Okay. So dose limitations and guidelines reduce overdose. I don't think we have any data. And there's no science to these dose limitations. That's what's so extraordinary. Um, except to suggest that those people who take less drugs have less complications. I mean, we know this, so, so any study would show this. So is there any evidence to really support this? And, um, and we have demonstrated in you know, really sophisticated pharmacologic studies where we've done pharmacology and we've done pharmacokinetics um, that, that every patient has such, there's such wide inter individual uh, variation to suggest that you know, setting a dose of 100 milligrams of morphine a day has any scientific reality except a political reality. And then this issue is, will tamper-resistant opioids reduce overdose misuse and abuse? As my drug abuse patients tell me, look at we're smarter than you. I mean, they tell me that all the time. So they are smarter than this. They'll figure out how to do this. They'll figure out how to get the drug. So is this what we know? And then the problem is, these are very costly drugs, so patients can't afford them. So how do we begin to deal with that issue? Then this whole issue of mandating CME programs to improve practice. We learn from California, doesn't seem to make much of a big aspect of it. And maybe, we have an, maybe we'll have a national pain strategy, but we don't have a public health approach to pain management. We have a public health approach to um, prescription drug abuse. This is not one to pain management. So we need to have the CDC reframe this. And now the CDC is writing guidelines for pain management as if they know what they are doing. So, so with that, um, what are the challenges to the cancer patient with pain? And then I'll stop. 
So this is what we're seeing every day. So this is what, and so I went to my colleagues on the pain and palliative care team and I said, like, tell me your everyday problems. And so I want to tell you that these are not vetted. Are they occurring in 100 people or they're occurring in 10 or they're occurring in one? But even if they're occurring in one, they're part of a bigger problem and I think, and we have really complex patients at Memorial and I know you might think that they have money but we take care of a decent number of Medicaid patients, a fair number of Medicare populations and then the sort of other um, well-insured individuals. So patients referred to hospice get switched to less expensive drugs causing inadequate relief uh, or excessive side effects. So we get them in the hospital, we get their pain really under good control, and then they get sent to an inpatient hospice unit or they get sent home to a hospice program, and the hospice doesn't want to pay for levorphanol. It doesn't want to pay for hydromorphone. So immediately the patient is now switched to the oral morphine that we know didn't work for them, and um, we're back into trouble. And the family then is calling us and saying, well, they switched our drugs and we're back where we were. They're vomiting all the time. This recently happened to a colleague. High co-payments by certain insurance companies de depend on the dose. So that um, if patients um, are taking oxy oxycontin or fentanyl, these are the most problematic because the high co-pays are so much that the families just can't afford them. Why is that the case? Um, insurance companies set maximum doses. Um, I got a letter recently of a patient that I have taken care of for the last seven years. And this is a woman who takes a large dose of methadone on a regular basis that has con been able to keep her pain well controlled from a very profound neuropathic pain from neurofibromatosis. So not a cancer patient, but considered a tumor patient because she's had neurofibromatosis. And the, it said, that you have two weeks to switch this patient from this regimen that she has been successfully on for six years uh, because this is the amount that we will only allow. But you can call up and you can um, uh, explain to us why you're doing this. So I, there's an emergency line and I call that emergency line and I gave the information to someone who took it down and then I wrote a letter to them. Um, and they did in fact finally approve it for one year that I could keep her on this same regimen. But I can tell you that lots of doctors are not going to spend the time to talk to the company, write the letters, and say eight hours of, six hours of your time is going to be spent negotiating uh, with someone on the other end who is not a pain expert, who is not necessarily a pharmacist, uh, who may be or may not be a nurse, um, but who has the regulations that they wish to meet, and you're just an outlier, and who would they listen to? Um, this issue of prior authorization. So um, we're now seeing in our Medicaid population um, that there's a requirement for prior authorization. It can take 72 hours um, if the appeal is denied. So what do you do for 72 hours if a patient can't get their drug? I mean, let, what is this about? Um, some require a prior authorization for dose change. So what that means is that a patient um, can't be uh, switched to a higher dose of drug without a prior authorization, so there's a time delay from the point that you think you should be doing this to then. Um, it's very hard to have a patient on any more than one opioid, uh, because that means they have to have two concurrent prescriptions of which you have to have prior authorization for each, and you're sort of like back and forth. So it's put in an administrative load to a very busy population of um, palliative care physicians that are caring for these uh, patients and are seeing on any one day upwards in a clinic of maybe 100, 120 patients, of which maybe 30 or 40 are having these kinds of problems that have to be dealt with. And are they dealt with by the doctor? Are they dealt with by our nurse? And they dealt with by our secretaries? And how we begin to deal with them. And that every prescription we write in New York, again, we have to go to the prescription monitoring system and put the data in. So this is a time sink that's profound that um, needs to be paid for by someone. And then the next one is the restricted travel for patients uh, if there's only one pharmacy who will dispense a drug. And so this is happening probably in more um, rural kinds of areas. Uh, but quite profound in the sense that the patient has a limited amount of medicine. They're supposed to get their drug next Tuesday, but they want to go visit their daughter in another state, but they can't go because they have to stay home to get the prescription before they are able to be uh, able to um, travel. And although for each of these, there are ways around it, okay? You can figure this out. You can put time into it. You can deal with these 
It's very, very onerous. And it's become so onerous that why would you want to prescribe an opioid for anyone? Why do you want to do this for this population? So this is what we're seeing as sort of a change in um, increasing um, um, aspects. So my last point, or last slide, is on this question that Myra posed of recriminalization. So this is who we're criminalizing. We're criminalizing the physicians who advocate for opioid use. Um, they used to be respected. Now it looks like they're in the hands of the drug company, okay? Um, and, you know, I don't take any, have, have not taken any money from drug companies for probably 15 years, uh, but, you know, everybody thinks, like, if I talk to a drug company person, I'm an advocate for them. Um, the physicians who participate in speakers' bureaus for pharmaceutical companies, uh, this is, again, across the board for many, many different diseases, and yet we have very open, transparent ways we begin to do this. And how are we going to teach doctors to how to use these drugs if we don't let the pharmaceutical companies help us teach patients how to use these drugs effectively. Um, the physicians who adapt their practice to patient needs. So you're seeing a patient, and they need a prescription, and they're going to be going away, and you're going to be going away, and so you predate the prescription. That's against the law, OK? But you know, we have to do this to just be practical. Because a patient can't spend five hours traveling back to New York City or for me to mail this prescription to them, for them to be able to have this prescription in hand. I mean, we need to make this practical. Now, if you're over 65, we can write drugs for three months. But oftentimes, the insurance companies won't pay for the drug for three months. So that's another problem. Then the physicians who practice pain management, they've been maligned across the board. Um, and then the pharmaceutical companies develop new products. Again, maligned. If it's an opioid, just forget it. It's not, you know, there's like immediately incredible negativity. And I think that I was hearing from Bob Twillman now that Congress wants to pass a law, or some, some people have put a bill before Congress, uh, that Congress should decide, uh, not the FDA, uh, whether pharmaceutical companies' new products should be, in fact, approved. So um, this is pretty extraordinary. So this is. And this is all around opioids, um, around the, the drug issues. And at the same time, I'm really optimistic that we could make some changes. Um, and I'm optimistic because there is a national pain strategy, and we have to bring all of these issues to the fore. Um, and we have to have people understand what the, what the concern is. But if we don't have any science, if we don't have any new drugs, um, if we don't have centers of excellence, we're not going anywhere. So the thing the national pain strategy has to deliver is centers of excellence. You know, we need science that can argue with the politics of this. So the last is a, a, the anecdotal stories of science. So in the 70s, when um, the, uh, uh, a major advocacy group in Washington wanted to legalize heroin uh, for the uh, management of cancer pain, those of us at Memorial said, you know, well, like, what's the science question here? You know, is it better? So we, we answered the question scientifically while the politics were playing out there. And the science question was, did heroin act faster? Yes. Um, was heroin better than morphine? Don't know. But of course, the British said, so much better. Every anecdote said it was so much better. So we did a carefully controlled randomized trial in cancer patients. Um, and the drug that we used, the heroin, we got from the government that they had you know, um, uh, been able to uh, secure uh, through um, being able to buy supplies of heroin on the street or uh, confiscate it from the street. And they cleaned up the morphine, and we called it diacetyl morphine because that's what heroin is, and we gave it to patients. And basically, patients couldn't tell morphine from heroin, and basically, we showed that heroin was a much more expensive way of delivering morphine to patients. Um, and so the, the science answered the question. And I think for each of these, we could answer these questions. We can answer the dose issue with a science issue. We can answer the question of whether um, tamper-proofs are better or not. Uh, we can answer the question of what the cost is by beginning to look at the realm of cost of, for these patient populations. But we have no funding. If one, less than 1% of the budget of NIH is going to be focused on uh, pain, um, and health services research monies are like 0.5%, and the CDC wastes its money on prescription drug abuse only, um, we, we have uh, enormous difficulties. So I'll stop at that point. Those are the politics. <laughs> So, so are we having a conversation now? <laughs>
Okay, yeah, so we, this is to mean to be, um, that was what I was told. So all of you may have other anecdotes. And Can I clarify, the, uh, the, the cystic fibrosis patients yeah. who are taking morphine right. for the dyspnea, right. they don't, they might not, uh, they might not be eligible for transplants because they per it's not for any medical reason. They're perceived as addicts or something. Right? Well, the, the, the concern is, is if, yes, the concern is that they're becoming dependent on this, and uh, that puts them at higher risk. So it, it sort of, it, it was what we faced in the 19, uh, late 70s um, when um, Dr. Perry at Cornell began to look at pain management in the burn units. So, you know, in the late 70s, debriding in pain units was without any analgesic control. So that was the reality, okay? And you know, suffer, this issue of you know, who suffers, how do you suffer? This was absolutely extraordinarily common. And one of our colleagues that, that uh, Rich and I worked with, um, who was a psychiatrist, was compelled uh, to begin to look at this phenomenon within the burn units. And, and for the individuals that were doing the debriding, it was as awful as it was for the patients who were being debrided because there was so much um, uh, degree of pain that they were witnessing. This is an acute, severe pain um, that could be managed in a variety of different approaches. And so they moved on to develop management approaches. Where burn pain treatment goes now is a little bit clarity. Before you go, yeah. um, would you please introduce yourself? There are lots of people oh, sorry. So I'm Richard Payne, I'm a physician, and I'm the uh, John B. Francis Chair at the Center for Practical Bioethics and also a faculty member at Duke University in uh, Medicine and Divinity, and a uh, former student of Kathy's. Um, so Kathy, the, and, and I actually want to bring Keith into this right. a little bit too, because when you were talking, you, you, uh, I went back to something Keith said in his talk about hierarchies of deservedness yeah. of pay. And, and, and the National Pain Strategy right. uh, has report, has introduced this new term called high impact chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Without a lot of science <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that, su that, that uh, suggests yeah. that there's some real face validity to this concept. Mm -hmm. So could you speak to that, that this notion of, you know, some people, there's pain, but some people just deserve mm -hmm. uh, better pain treatment than others. <laughs> right, well I, I must say that I've sort of used that argument. Um, I think when we were at an international level, uh, since I, I've worked a lot internationally, um, at an international level we made the decision that we would have the dying cancer patient as the Trojan horse for changing pain policy. Who was going to argue about that? They were dying, they had significant pain, we proved that they didn't have pain. We can measure pain. Uh, we can document pain, we can objectify pain, um, we can look at correlates to pain, we know how to do that, and we had done that for the cancer population. So we used that as the Trojan horse because we thought if we had the opportunity to develop a field of caring for that population, and I think hospice is probably the best demonstrated that model here in, this, in the US, that we could demonstrate and teach physicians how to use these drugs, um, how to learn what drugs were more appropriate, how to learn um, the pharmacology, how to learn the pharmacokinetics, um, how to learn the regulations, and that we'd have that model that then could be expanded out um, into uh, a larger population. So that became sort of the natural model. So we have, I have to say, I've exploited that idea that some people are more deserving or not deserving. And, and again, playing to the politics of it. But um, if we had started with a chronic, non-malignant pain patient um, who had ill-defined pain, they, no one would be even interested in this uh, or care about it. So I think we've exploited that. So how do you then come to the next point that you're making of, of this idea of high-impact pain? I think, I think the worry that I have, um, and maybe it's a good idea to think about high-impact pain, or to think it, because they don't want to call it serious, because every pain is serious. So I think the idea of calling it high impact pain, I think they'll, they'll run into the science issue. That you know, every smart pain methodologist out there will say, well, how did you decide who's got high impact pain? And what methods did you use? And how did you do that? And I'm afraid that they'll lose what they're trying to get at right. 
because they won't have a scientific basis. And it's a little bit like what has happened in England uh, when they created this Liverpool pathway for the dying, okay? And because they didn't do good studies about it in advance and they moved it into a clinical arena, it then fell apart. So I, I think that's a cautionary tale that you, when you start doing this, you gotta have some science behind it. Keith, did you wanna comment on your, on your comment about hierarchies of pain dependent? Um, yeah, I think, is this on? Yeah, the, 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 to me the Trojan horse strategy is, it, it works and also it doesn't work Absolutely. in the sense that it, one, suggests that pain should be regarded as legitimate and who could argue with the dying patient in cancer, but then what it says is, well, you have to be legitimate. a dying patient in cancer to warrant this and right. the further away you are from that dying, the less deserved. And then, of course, it gets inflected with all other kinds of judgments mm -hmm. about deservedness um, in the era of welfare and et cetera. So I think it is a, um, it's a successful strategy, and the trick is to figure out a way to continue it but, but extend the sense of deservedness mm -hmm. um, to others. And it's, I, I, I did have a question, if I could sure. sort of pivot no, from please. that, which is, um, Dr. Foley, I was wondering whether you could say a little bit more about who in particular is driving the trend towards criminal, the-, the, the, the criminalization? The, well, yeah, exactly. And, and particularly sort of the new rules regarding um, reducing physician prescribing in order to limit overdose. Is it, I mean, I can imagine a multiplicity of organizations mm -hmm. um, whether it's that are that are pushing those kinds of regulations, but it, it, I'm just interested in where you see the, where you see that action being generated. I think there are multiple sources, and I think Bob Toolman ought to come in on this, and others might want to comment on on this issue. I think we're, um, I think we're 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 seeing it uh, from a group that we didn't expect to see it from, and that is from the addiction specialists. So uh, the addiction specialists have decided that overprescription is the problem and that um, doctors are the overprescribers and we need to target doctors to stop the overprescribing. And, um, and I, don't, I don't want to argue that we shouldn't target doctors, uh, but it's much more complicated than that. The second piece is that it's decided that it's the primary care doctors that are really the bad guys. Um, and they don't know anything, and now they're prescribing all these drugs out there. So that's the second group. Then in New York State, um, our, this is when, um, uh, when a, um, an advocacy group um, uh, led by um, a, an individual who has been a great advocate for controlling prescribing uh, went to our mayor and went to our various um, uh, forces within the city and said that the way we had to stop the prescribing of opioids in our emergency rooms was the following, um, that acute pain only lasts three days, that patients who come to emergency rooms in New York City um, should only be given, if they, if they are given an opioid, it should be only a three-day supply uh, because acute pain is gone in three days. Didn't we all know that? Okay, there's no science to that. And they wrote a series of guidelines for emergency rooms of how they should practice in the city and that this should be, which would guide their practice. Now let's be real. Who goes to our emergency rooms with acute pain? Our Medicaid population. How are they going to get an appointment to see a doctor to get another prescription within three days? Not gonna happen. So you're immediately targeting a population of individuals who you think are at risk for abuse um, in this way. Second of all, there are some emergency rooms that basically will not in any way fill a prescription for a patient for an opioid if they come in requesting it if they've been previously on one. So how do we monitor those emergency rooms for the sort of the ethics of that care? I mean, how do we begin to get at that piece? So the question you're saying is who's driving it? It's creating, it's these the statement that you are bad. So every doctor now is like saying, whoa, if I write this prescription, you know, I'm going to be on the line if I'm in an ER. 
but we're seeing it in our own, um, in physicians in general, who feel increasingly more conservative about how they're prescribing opioids, and the data shows they're much more, we, we always, in New York State, they've always been conservative, they're even more conservative, uh, because of this concern of the oversight to that. But I think, Bob, you should comment, because you know so much about this. Well, I, I won't, I'm, I'm Bob Twelman, I'm the Executive Director of the American Academy of Pain Management. Uh, and actually, I don't want to take a lot of time doing it right now because all of this okay. is actually in my talk that's coming up. Okay, the, great. The two of you have set me up perfectly okay. and the check's in the mail. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, Lynn, do you want to comment? I, I actually am going to take um, privilege here and <clears throat> in part address your question, Keith. We have uh, come to believe that the addiction and the pain communities need to work together and that we need to be building some bridges between these groups. Mm -hmm. And that in fact, by working together, as I, I think you actually intimated in your remarks, we will have more success than we will pecking one another's eyes out or competing for really crumbs at the table of NIH. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a little dismayed to say, however, that my experience thus far is that the addiction advocacy community is not very welcoming of us because we have been so stigmatized. Mm -hmm. And what I see happen all the time, and it's so hard to mm -hmm. rationally address this, is that dying children are used as a playing card. Um, I was in a meeting in Florida where the Attorney General um, was so inappropriate I could hardly believe it in talking about that she had pictures of children who had been killed mm -hmm. with opiates around her office. And um, I couldn't restrain myself from saying, you know, one dead child is too many. I mean, no one is going to argue about that. But when we were with the IOM committee, we heard from one parent whose 13-year-old had endometriosis, and they took her from one specialist to another specialist to another specialist who told her she'd just have to learn to live with it, and who, after her final doctor's appointment, went to her room crying, slammed the door, when her mom went to call her for dinner, found her hanging in a closet. Now, I think there has to be a way better in creating policy than two wacky women like me and the Attorney General of Florida comparing horrible Having stories children. about the deaths yeah. of children. Exactly. So, Kathy, I'm curious if you've had any experience in trying to build relationships in that community if you've had any success, what tactics have you used? Um, so I work closely with um, the, uh, the group that have focused very much on harm reduction approaches to um, uh, drugs. And um, I'm enormously impressed by their degree of advocacy about harm reduction. Um, their ability to work on getting naloxone available. And so I think the harm reduction advocates who see drug policy in a much more liberal fashion have, are much more open to this perspective um, of thinking about how do you create these balances. So I think there's a harm reduction community, and we've been working at them with them at a, a major international level. So when we go to the UN when we go to the UNODC and all these various international drug policy groups, um, or go, we, go, we go with them saying we need it for medical management, they're caring for those individuals who, use, uh, who misuse or abuse drugs and the care that they need. So I think that that's been the population more, but I, but, but, uh, and that in, at an international level. I think within the US, I'm, um, I'm just seeing an increasing negativity on the addiction specialist part at a formal level uh, to this pain issue. They want to stop prescribing, they want to 
Um, they're not so sure who should get pain medicines. They want to create the hierarchy of who's okay and who shouldn't get it. Um, and, um, and it seems to me they have a greater, they seem to have a greater presence in Washington, and they clearly have a greater presence in NIH because they have a National Institute of Drug Abuse. So they have the power at the, you know, they're, they're controlling the power at the present time. We don't have a strong National Institute of Pain. <laughs> uh, we don't have one, and you know, maybe never gonna get one, but what, whatever the case is, they have the power, and they're sort of driving the thinking about it. And, um, and I think they want to be collaborative, and I think they want to be collegial, but I think we need to do this. But I, I do think the harm reduction people, they're the people that are pushing the naloxone. They're the people that are the advocates for that. They're a, a different population. They're the people that are pushing medical marijuana. So, you know, it's like you have to decide who you, you want to be with at the time you want to be with on what topics do you want to be with. But, um, and I wanted to come back to Keith's point of being optimistic, because I am optimistic about this issue of the liberalization of drug wars. And um, in 2016, there is going to be what's a UN General Assembly, uh, a special session called UNGAS is basically it. It's going to be held in Vienna, not in New York, which is problematic, but it's on drug policy. And so we've been all sort of tooling up to argue for the availability of uh, analgesic drugs for patients, for opioids and controlled substances for patients with pain in this reevaluation of drug policy internationally. And so it's a place where the harm reduction people and the, you know, are coming together uh, with uh, the uh, pain people to say, this is important drugs. Um, this is how we should do this. And as we move into individual countries, we any legislation that we develop in an individual country has to pay attention to the availability of drugs for medical use, both for the treatment of addiction and for the management of pain. And that we don't allow the governments to pass legislation that says it's only for the cancer population. It's the pain population. So we have very clear ways of creating public policy around on drugs that respect both the importance of both. But I think I haven't worked enough with, except, I mean, there's, you know, the, it, there have been various groups in this country that have been pushing, um, that, that are led by sort of addiction experts who are against the pain community, basically. Bob, did you want to? Yeah, you know, Myra, your, your remarks reminded me of something I once heard from a policymaker, and, and he said that the plural of anecdote is policy. And yes. unfortunately, that's often true, and, and it sort of, gets to one of the things that I find very interesting with the work that I do is as a psychologist, when I sit in a legislature or a policy making body and I watch what goes on, I'm alternately fascinated and frightened by what I see. The trouble is that so often they're making decisions on the basis of emotion right. rather than on the basis of logic. And science. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and science. Exactly. And you can see this when you go to FDA hearings and the, the parents of children who've died get up and show pictures of their kids and they say, you know, this is my daughter. She was a high school student. She went to a party, took somebody's long-acting Oxycontin right. and, died. and died of an overdose and therefore hydrocodone should be rescheduled. It, it's just a complete disconnect. But I think maybe one of the ways that we have failed is by failing to make people with pain as sympathetic as those exactly. people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that if we keep pounding them with the facts that it's going to change things, maybe we have to sort of fight fire with fire mm -hmm. and get into the emotional aspects of this as well. Mm -hmm. Where? Yes. You got a mic. Son? Speak up. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I'm William Brooks, osteopathic physician. Can you hear him? Here, take mine. I'm William Brooks. I'm a specialist in osteopathic manipulative medicine. Yes, there are a few of us around, believe it or not, still. I've cared for chronic, multi-regional, musculoskeletal pain patients for 34 years often successfully, and by that I don't refer to that as success as maintenance care, but actually restoring them to pain-free life. I've worked in private settings and in academic settings, most prominently in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Arizona for a number of years. 
I am struck by the first two uh, presentations that have to do with the tension mostly about drugs. And I've devoted my career to helping people without drugs, needles, mm -hmm. or knives. At the same time, I recognize there's a time for and place for all of that, but the big tension is about drugs. And I was very gratified, Dr. Floley, for you to mention a number of times that, frankly, it's about the science. Mm -hmm. What we need are biomarkers right. for pain. Yes. And what we need are reliable and valid, valid ways to evaluate the musculoskeletal system so that people with back pain don't fall into the black hole of there's nothing organically wrong with you, therefore you don't deserve care. That particular niche is what I've devoted my career to. Dr. Weilu, my suggestion to you is that you need to do a book on the microcosm that hasn't been spoken about here. You've done a great job of talking about this in broad cultural mm -hmm. right-wing politics versus left-wing politics perspectives. But what you need to focus on are the academic medical centers, yeah, right. which frankly, I'm going to use a four-letter word here, are cesspools of politics. <laughs> <laughs> and they are driven by money. Yeah. It's all about the money. And it's not just NIH funding that you're having trouble getting, but academic medical centers get their funding from lots of other sources. Mm -hmm. And somebody needs to step up the plate and do the kind of research that would cut through what might otherwise be an eternal tension that you've all been identifying. Mm -hmm. I would also suggest that another book you might want to do <laughs> is looking at the difference, while well, you've done a beautiful job about American politics, I think you can compare and contrast what goes on in other countries compared to here. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to teach my field of expertise, not only here in the States to a wide variety of professional audiences, but also German MD physicians. And what struck me was the composition of that audience, which would never happen in the United States. Most of them are orthopedic surgeons. Mm -hmm. There aren't any orthopedic surgeons interested in non-surgical care of musculoskeletal problems in this country. And it's because of the money. The way physicians are reimbursed in Europe is profoundly different than here. So those are my two practical suggestions to you, Dr. Weilu, <laughs> mm -hmm. and to the audience in general. I think. The politics are going to go on forever until we can elevate our science. And we got to look behind why science gets done in the way it gets done to the money. Thank you. Either of you want to comment or do we? OK, I we'll move. I would say that you're so eloquent, I would suggest it right back to you. Excuse me. My plate's full right now. Yes. Sir. I'm Don Giffen. I'm a retired lawyer. My uh, medical qualification uh, is that I'm uh, 84 years old and probably more, have more experience than most people in this room. Uh, my question <laughs> is about the reality of chronic pain. And uh, uh, I have not heard anything that would indicate to me that chronic pain is forever, although that does seem to be the underlying assumption. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, particularly with regard to uh, the Civil War, where the main treatment was amputation, right. and whether those people who apparently were probably diagnosed with chronic pain, whether they still had chronic pain 20, 30, 40 years after their amputations. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, I was wondering about compensation. Right and whether the Perfect attitude of compensation can actually result in a, a diminution, if not the alleviation, of chronic pain. Uh, those are really great questions. So Weir Mitchell um, was a neurologist who described the um, significant um, neuropathic phantom limb pain that occurred post-amputation. And his studies go out 20 and 30 years um, that describe these individuals 
who had persistent phantom pain. And I think, as you know, um, morphine was widely used at that, during that period of time and often for the management of those patients over a long chronic period, uh, for a long uh, period of time in a variety of types of elixirs that were available. Um, so we saw the rise of the use of morphine in the post-Civil War, and the population that was basically using were these amputees. And we have this new opportunity with the wars that we're currently in that our military has been looking at um, better approaches to manage um, post-surgical, um, post-amputation pain uh, in individuals who are coming, who came out of Iraq and uh, Kuwait and out, and out of Afghanistan, um, with a lot of new knowledge about how to best manage them. You know, very aggressive management in the field, uh, flood them with local anesthetics to prevent the development of these circuits, and then seeing a much better improvement in outcomes long term. Um, this issue of compensation, I think Keith brought this up in the whole disability discussion. Um, workmen's compensation and pain, um, there are books and books and books written about how they play into each other. Um, and there is a population of individuals who, when they get their work workmen's compensation finalized, uh, they seek less medical care, so they're less costly to the healthcare system. So there is that data. Uh, but there also is this um, uh, concern uh, to what extent should um, the insurers um, support such individuals for long periods of time. And there's enormous fraud in that population, and that's why the insurance companies are doing videotapes of these people who say that they're on workman's comp, and, and then they see them you know, lifting heavy boxes and uh, seeing them dancing and doing all sorts of activities that would be unacceptable if they fit the criteria for why they would receive workman's compensation. So that's a mixed bag of the right people getting it, but a lot of fraud in that whole arena as people try to gain the system. So again, there's a balance that's necessary. So and, and internationally, this is a very big issue, the, the issue of compensation and how a country, socialized countries like Sweden, for example, deals with workmen's compensation. They have a lot of expertise looking at the pain perspective. 